Welcome to Critical Thought TV. I'm your host, Stuart Dambrot. Uh, today we're honored to have Dr. Aubrey de Grey, uh, biomedical gerontologist, chief science officer at the SENS Foundation, editor-in-chief of Rejuvenation Research, and author of Ending Aging, published in 2007, uh, which has informed uh, a great many people about his work in uh, treating the, uh, the impacts and, and effects upon aging. Welcome. Hello. Good to be on the show. Um, I'd like to start um, with, uh, as I said, I think a great many viewers are going to be familiar with you and your work. But just to be sure, uh, I'll start with a brief intro, a brief primer, if you will, uh, into strategies for engineered negligible senescence. Um, Starting with some basic concepts and definition, perhaps uh, an overview of the seven main components, uh, and then a couple of differentiating factors, rejuvenation versus uh, regeneration, and SENS itself versus some other memes that are out there, anti-aging and life extension. Sure. Well, um, that's quite a spectrum of things to cover all in one go. Um, the idea embodied in the concept of SENS is simply that the most effective and most practical way to extend the, um, the healthy, functioning, fully functioning longevity of a living organism such as a human being is the same as for a simple man-made machine like a car or an aeroplane. Namely, that rather than trying to prevent the machine from accumulating molecular and cellular damage, as a normal side effect of its operation, we could go in and periodically repair that damage as what you might call preventative maintenance before it gets to the level of abundance that causes the machine to stop working so well or perhaps to stop working at all. So it, it, then it, is this fair to say that it, it's a way of um, uh, constraining the problem space? By rather to have to rather having, than having to um, identify and work with uh, the disparate and interrelated causes of that damage, uh, which you know has borne some fruit but not that much. You're working with the products, the end products themselves, uh, which is again uh, a smaller number and tend to be easily acquired and removed. Is that so that's basically it? Yes. I mean the number of things that actually go wrong in this way, the number of types of molecular and cellular damage is actually pretty large. And I'll come in a moment to the fact that that's not really such a problem because they come into a relatively manageable number of large categories. But <coughs> the key thing is that, as you mentioned, the way the human body works is, I mean, just indescribably intricate. And also, we are indescribably ignorant of it still. We know a lot more than we did, let's say, 30, 50 years ago, but still, every biologist will, will agree that the amount we don't know is vastly greater than the amount we do. So if we want to do anything about aging anytime soon, then trying to tweak that system so that these various types of damage are not laid down at the rate that they normally are is really a non-starter for the foreseeable future. The only option, really, is to go in and repair this damage after it's been created, but before it has got so abundant that it starts getting in the way. This is the really good thing. We have this sort of window of opportunity, if you like. The fact is, you know, your average 40-year-old, shall we say, is actually still pretty much as functional as your average 25-year-old, as long as they haven't got overweight or whatever. And that means that the damage that's accumulated in the meantime, which is ultimately the explanation for why the 40-year-old doesn't have so long to live as the 25-year-old, hasn't actually done any harm yet. That damage is not I participating see. in metabolism, if you like. I see. So then that would, uh, now, now it, it's very clear the correlation between the age at which um, some of the techniques or possibilities you'll be talking about uh, when they're applied uh, is directly correlated with the <clears throat> uh, years of um, robust health that can be added to an individual's uh, life expectancy. This is right, yes. The, 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 all of these types of damage are intrinsic side effects of the normal functioning of the human body, which is what biologists mean when they use the word metabolism. And mm -hmm. so they're going to accumulate throughout life, however long we live. And there's not much that we can do about changing the rate at which that happens. Of course, there are things we can do that might accelerate it, like you know, smoking or getting overweight, mm -hmm. for example. But without, um, apart from these really obvious things, there's not a lot we can do, because the main causes of this damage are 
non-negotiable aspect of being alive, like breathing. Uh, so, so in other words, um, there are uh, consequences of the way uh, our metabolic engines evolved over it, time. Exactly. There are consequences of the way that the human body works, just mm -hmm. in the same way that you know, rust is a consequence of the way oh, that cars right. work. If you don't use them, then they might not rust so fast. But if, you, mm. if, if they're operating, then they're going to accumulate rust. But yet, we have cars that are 50 years old driving around the streets of this country. We have cars that are 100 year old, years old driving around a few, in, in, a few of them. And um, that's because preventative maintenance has succeeded in removing the rust you know, before, it, before the doors fell off. Or they live in Death Valley. <laughs> well, that's also true, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, that, that being said, and um, there are seven main components, but that, I think, is a, a deeper discussion that might take a, a bit of time. Uh, of those, though, I was particularly interested in the mitochondrial question because okay. um, many, but not all, <coughs> might not be aware of it. It has its own separate DNA lineage mm -hmm. and how the, um, the free radicals that are generated as part of the mitochondrial operation uh, have a local effect, even though they're distributed, that may impact um, the, uh, the, the senescence issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, um, out of these seven categories, which we'll get onto later, actually the accumulation of mutations in the mitochondrial DNA is a bit of an orphan, if you like, it's a bit of an mm -hmm. exception. Because all the other six, we can point to specific major age-related diseases, age-related causes of death in the Western world that are predominantly caused by that particular category. For mitochondrial mutations, that's not the case. We can't say that there's this particular disease. Oh, um, and so, a lot of, so some people say that you know, it, it's still possible that mitochondrial mutations are actually pretty harmless and they don't significantly contribute to age-related ill health at all. But equally, there is other well, interpretations of the evidence that say that actually, no, just the opposite, that Yes, the mechanisms by which mitochondrial mutations contribute to aging are subtle and perhaps elaborate, but mm. that they may be actually much more pervasive than most of the ah, other things. Um, so my, my view is I don't really know who's right, but I definitely don't want to rely on being over-optimistic and saying that it doesn't matter because we'd look pretty stupid if we fixed everything else and then, <laughs> and then you know, every, uh, the, we were still dying on schedule because we hadn't bothered to fix this one. Right? Um, so, yeah, so then the question is, uh, what will we do? Uh, mitochondria, as you say, they have their DNA, they accumulate mutations. Um, the mitochondrial DNA encodes only 13 proteins, a tiny, tiny proportion of the total number of proteins that cells can make. But those proteins are essential parts of the way that mitochondria process nutrients and oxygen and combine them to extract energy from the nutrients. Ah, the and ATP cycle, the Krebs. The, the, well, not the Krebs cycle. Not well, the Krebs cycle. Actually, it's just the respiratory chain, which is the ah, part in the membrane that does the last part of, uh, of this process. Um, yes, the whole, of the, the whole of the Krebs cycle is nuclear coded, it turns out. Um, OK, so, uh, so there are essential genes. And um, in order to prevent those that process, the respiratory chain, from going downhill progressively with not just an impact on our ability to process nutrients, but also some active toxicity that people think occurs as a result of elevated levels of free radicals in the wrong place, things like that. Um, uh, what we can do about this is, in my view, well, there are a few, a few options, but the option that we're pursuing that I think has the most promise is to put copies of the mitochondrial DNA into the nucleus, into our normal chromosomal DNA. Now, in order to make that work, we would have to modify those genes somewhat so that the proteins they encode will be transported back into the mitochondria and assembled into the respiratory chain just as if they had been synthesized within the mitochondria in the way they normally are. Uh, but right. we pretty much know how to do that now. Well, there are still some details to be worked out, that's for sure. But as a result of some breakthroughs over the past few years, it's looking a lot more practical than it used to. That is, that, that's what, one of the reasons I asked the question. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, the, the one question I had about that is uh, the, presumably, uh, um, the, uh, and this is a big presumption on my part, uh, the mitochondria would still be doing its thing and generating uh, these proteins. So how do the substitutes uh, that are generated <coughs> by the transposed DNA into the cell nucleus override, if you will, the, the production by the mitochondria itself? Yeah, right, okay, so there's two questions here. The first question is, would it be a problem if 
the cell was making these proteins in the mitochondria and also making them in the nucleus. Right. Without, and let's, in the first instance, not talk about the situation when there's any mutation. Let's talk about when the proteins are still perfectly fine, just you'd be making more of the proteins in from two different places. Would that be a problem? There's pretty good evidence that no, it wouldn't be a problem, that the mitochondrion is already very well set up to regulate how much protein is lying oh, around and to, you know, to use what it needs and destroy what it doesn't need. So we don't think there's going to be a problem there. There's the evidence for that, well, there's extensive evidence for that. Um, the second question, which may be what you were really alluding to, is supposing that there were mutations in the mitochondrial DNA that caused the, the, the mitochondrion to create bad versions, you know, broken versions of the Something proteins, like then how would the nuclear copies actually, you know, uh, override the, exactly uh, and right. exclu like, exclude the, um, the mutant thank copies? Thank you for asking my question in, much, in a much better way than I did. So the good news here, the extremely good news, in aging is that the, there are various types of mutations that could, in principle, happen. The type of mutation that we overwhelmingly see in aging in the mitochondrial DNA is called a deletion, where a large mm -hmm. chunk of the molecule actually goes completely missing. And, well, for complicated reasons to do with the distribution of other elements in that mitochondrial DNA, this causes all 13 proteins to be completely not made at all. So there are, not, there, are no, there are no, like, what's called dominant negative effects. There are no broken proteins being made. There's just no proteins being made whatsoever. So there's no need to worry about competition, so we say, between the mutant copy and the normal copy from the nucleus. So then the final question on this topic uh, would be then, if the, would it be possible to induce the microdeletion earlier on and, and that make it one of the cases where that form of negative impact could actually be prevented? Yeah. People have been looking at the possibility of eliminating mit mutant mitochondrial DNA um, in inherited mitochondriopathies, diseases caused by the mitochondrial mutation. There are some very rare cases where a particular mutation, for whatever reason, is able to be transmitted through the maternal germline from the mother into, into the unfertilized egg, and then to give an accelerated accumulation of mitochondrial I mutations. See. See. But deletions of the sort I'm describing here are never inherited. They always happen only during life. And so it's a very different problem, uh, and not a problem that really relates directly to aging. Thank you so much.